Welcome to everyone. My name is Giulia Fornione and I work as a policy officer at Eurate Empower. Um, I hope that everyone can hear me well. Um, so today we're organizing this, web, uh, this webinar as part of the Celsius Initiative. For those of you who don't know what the Celsius Initiative is, it's a demand-driven collaboration app for efficient and integrated heating and cooling um, Thank you, Mina. Solutions supporting city in their uh, energy transition. Uh, it's an initiative sponsored uh, by the European, founded by the European Commission, and Eurate Empower is one of the main partners. Okay. Uh, can we go to the next? Thank you. Perfect. Um, as for today's webinar, uh, maybe the, the slide up, the slide before. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to focus on the renovation wave and particularly how it will provide support to cities and uh, regions across the EU in, the de in uh, decarbonizing their building stock. Um, as we know, the renovation wave has been identified as a um, flagship initiative by the European Green Deal. Uh, we all know that decarbonizing buildings is essential to reach the climate and energy goals set, set out by the European Green Deal. Uh, however, we're also aware that the, the size of this challenge is, is huge and therefore it's important to consider all the available technology which will speed up the decarbonization of the building stock. Um, buildings are the first consumers of the heating and cooling sector. Uh, space heating in particular accounts for more than 80% of heating and, and cooling consumption in the colder areas. And that is why uh, it's important that the renovation wave, uh, it's not just limited to the renovation of the building stock, but also introduce and guarantee uh, efficient and decarbonize uh, its supply. Uh, local authorities uh, across the EU are already making use of efficient heating and cooling solution to decarbonize their cities. And that's why their voices should be heard. And this is exactly what we will try to do today, particularly during this uh, first session we will discuss uh, what's in the renovation wave uh, for cities and particularly what could be the impact of such initiative in the deployment of sustainable heating and cooling in cities. Before I introduce uh, our wonderful speakers, uh, I just want to provide you with two key information. As you can see, you're all muted right now, but you can still communicate with us. Uh, I would advise you to use the chat box if you're experiencing any, any technical issues so that someone from our support team can help you out. If you have any question, which I hope you will do, for our speakers, please do use the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. And it will be also great if you could please address uh, or mention the name of the speakers to whom you're addressing your question to. Now we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to introduce you to our speakers. Today with us, we have Carlin Goldstein, who is the Energy Efficiency Advisor to the Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. We have Edward James Smith, who is the Energy Attaché for the Permanent Representation of Denmark to the EU. Rene Bruel, who is the Head of the Buildings Program of the European Climate Foundation. And last but not least, Susanna Farde Koper, who is a PhD Fellow at Albrecht University. Welcome everyone, thank you for being here with us today. Um, so now we will proceed like this. Each speaker will have max five minutes each to, uh, for their presentation. And then we will, go, uh, we will open the question for, we will open the floor for question and answer. Um, uh, so Carly's with STAR and he will provide an overview of the commission's work on the renovation wave. Edward will provide an overview of what our member states are expecting from this uh, renovation wave from the Danish point of view. Rene will focus on the key findings of the newly published European Climate Foundation report on zero carbon buildings. And finally, Susanna will focus on the local aspect uh, to synergies between renovation and the heat supply. So Carlis, the floor is all yours. Hello and good morning to everybody. I hope that uh, you can hear and see me well. Good. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Celsius Initiative for organizing this event and for inviting uh, us to speak here. Uh, it's very timely because the Commission is uh, working on the renovation wave. It's a proposal that is scheduled for adoption for the 14th of October. 
And right now, the finalization is ongoing to launch the inter-service uh, uh, discussions uh, among the colleagues in the, in the commission. So I think that the key word here is the decarbonization of uh, buildings. And within that framework, as explained by Julia, uh, heating and cooling is the major uh, CO2 emitter and also an energy consumer. So we'll have to see uh, that in the, as one of the key aspects to decarbonize the European economy on the pathway of uh, carbon neutrality. So what is the big picture? Uh, you may recall that uh, in November 2018, the Commission came out with a long-term strategy. Uh, that was uh, an explanation of the Commission's ambition uh, and a pathway how to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, across the sectors in the EU. And we see that buildings there uh, have a very big role. Um, and uh, it, it will be impossible to uh, decarbonize the European economy without uh, addressing the building sector. Uh, it's about 36% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions in the economy that the buildings uh, produce and uh, uh, approximately 11% of the building stock in the EU is renovated each year. And that's a positive figure. The issue with that figure is that uh, most of the renovation action that takes place uh, is not energy performance related. Uh, in many countries, the energy renovation rates are actually close to zero. And uh, we find that the EU average is around 0.2%. And what do we mean by this uh, energy performance renovation? Uh, we mean renovation that uh, reduces the uh, greenhouse gas footprint and energy consumption uh, to an extent that uh, could help us uh, reach the European targets. We have the 2030 targets, uh, which will be revised upwards uh, in a short while, and then we have the 2050 targets. So um, the benefits of uh, decarbonizing our existing buildings are, of course, the reduction of the energy consumption, but also the higher integration rates of renewable energy, the creation of local jobs in a highly EU-centered value chain, um, and it introduces new technologies and services. And one might ask, uh, uh, is 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 the process going on quickly enough? And uh, the Commission feels that uh, there is still a lot of uh, potential to speed it up. So we see that energy efficiency needs uh, investment. The building sector is rather big, so only public funds will not be enough, but might be enough to um, prime uh, further engagement from, uh, from private funding. Um, and energy efficiency investments do offer attractive returns. The surprising thing, if we look at um, what's going on in, in terms of action, is that uh, often energy efficiency is not the first consideration uh, when doing renovation. And this is shown by the statistics that energy performance renovation is not on the forefront. Secondly, when energy performance uh, renovation does happen, then it also seems that energy efficiency is not the first consideration. And that might feel counterintuitive, uh, but when we look, for example, at uh, industries, at businesses, or at uh, public buildings, then it's often either the corporate culture that uh, supports energy performance and uh, re reduction of uh, the carbon footprint, or its regulation. So that's why um, we believe that the renovation wave will need public support and as a result, a change of a mindset. So that in the end, um, the intensity of public intervention can reduce. So what are the focus areas uh, for the upcoming renovation wave? Uh, first of all, worst performing buildings and energy poverty that's to deal with economic and climate vulnerabilities right now and in the future and addressing the increasing inequalities. Secondly, public buildings, schools and hospitals, because in current situation and especially in the beginning of a policy uh, wave, 
the public sector should take the lead. And uh, focusing on public building schools and hospitals allows immediate and visible improvements for the citizens. Plus it will prime the scale up and hopefully make um, technologies available at a scale and at a lower, lower price point. Uh, fourth important area is decarbonizing heating and cooling, which I believe uh, the audience is interesting to hear. And that's uh, to uh, reduce energy use and CO2 emission. And finally, uh, the fourth focus area is neighborhood approaches. And these are to create the scale for uh, fundability and policy at, uh, at national level. So what's the importance of the local area? I think it's crucial because at the local level uh, is the information about the building stock. All eyes are on preparing good quality project pipelines at this early stage of the renovation wave and for rolling out one-stop shops where people could have access to uh, technical assistance, to advice on uh, best funding options and also about uh, competent technical support. So the important level is very, very important to link these different areas up uh, coming from, uh, let's say, EU level policies, national, regional, local policies, and to also integrate across different policy areas. So we have energy planning, but certainly there's urban planning, spatial planning associated to it, urban mobility planning. Um, and we think that all of this should be treated together. We are undergoing the dual energy and digital transition, and we want the buildings and the infrastructure to be um, ready for the next three decades. So to sum up, um, the uh, EU citizens, according to our open public consultation, see renovation as a way to reduce energy poverty and lower energy bills. And we need to contribute to the circular economy side, create the jobs, the labor market uh, relevant skills, and commit, uh, and commit to making uh, the built environment a better place to live. And with this, I'd like to conclude and look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Carlis. Uh, Edward, you might wanna start. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you to Carlos as well for the, the introduction and just to underline that today um, I'll be presenting a, a Denmark's point of view on the renovation wave. Um, we have had su some support for uh, various degrees in council for our position, uh, but just to underline that this is uh, just the Danish um, government's opinion that I'm, that I'm representing today and not uh, that of any other member state. Um, so on the, con uh, on the, uh, on the renovation wave, uh, our priorities, we have three priorities for, uh, for what we're looking for and hoping the commission will deliver on the, uh, on the renovation wave. And the first is that there's a clear focus of what is, um, trying to be achieved from the renovation wave. Um, it's a policy, uh, that must have um an overriding goal and in the fact that it has been put towards the energy our belief uh, our, our um conviction is is that the renovation wave must provide a substantial contribution to achieving our common european target for energy efficiency um, and this is then achieved through the renovation of buildings but i think that there should be um clarity on is the goal just to renovate buildings or is the goal to achieve energy efficiency through uh, building renovations that also have a, a substantial other benefits for uh, local communities and for the EU as, as a whole. So our second um, priority for the renovation wave is that the recommendations from the European Court of Auditors uh, report on uh, our previous experiences with renovation uh, and uh, energy-based renovations in buildings is, is, uh, are, are taken into account. Um, the report highlights a series of 
barriers, difficulties, um, unfortunate practices that have not delivered really on, um, or have prevented uh, European funds from delivering on the ambitions that we have had uh, or wish to achieve for energy efficiency in buildings. And we hope that the renovation wave, uh, the commission strategy will take account of these uh, recommendations and make a commitment to implementing them in the renovation wave. Our third um, priority, and this I think was made quite clear in the council conclusions from June, which touched on this issue, and we had broad support from 17 or 18 member states, is that we should adopt a holistic approach to energy efficiency and renovations in buildings um, in the renovation wave. And this is especially focusing on um, heating um, and common heating solutions, such as district heating, for example. That um, there are, as uh, Carlos mentioned, substantial uh, potential for energy efficiency gains um, in buildings, but the carbon footprint of the building is also determined um, and the energy consumption and the costs of energy and heating is also determined by the supply of heat um, or the supply of energy. And in district heating, um, these are generally uh, simple, um, uh, relatively inexpensive um, and um, labor intensive improvements that can be made in improving the infrastructure within the building. So the hot water pipes, um, thermostats, these type of uh, um, initiatives within the building, the heat exchanger, between the system and the building, but also in the pipes that are feeding um, the, uh, the pipes and the pumps that are feeding the buildings with uh, hot water uh, to, uh, um, for, for heating. So we would very much like to see the um, renovation wave also looking at how to improve and reduce the cost of the energy being supplied to the buildings, not only by having an end use um, solution, but also by looking at a holistically approach of how do we reduce the cost of the energy being provided and how do we improve the energy services that are, are being put into these buildings. So we, we, we hope that the um, commission will heed the, uh, the, the wishes of, of the many member states as expressed in the counter conclusions from June and um, include the valuable contribution that a um, a district heating systems, for example, can provide in improving um, heating or energy services as well as reducing carbon footprints and reducing uh, energy bills substantially. We also believe that, that looking at a holistic approach and a common heating supply solutions uh, also will help reduce the carbon footprints of entire communities and not just those who are fortunate enough to receive assistance in, um, uh, for the particular building they live in. So uh, I think this is, um, this is where I'll stop um, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing the other uh, participants and listening to, uh, to people's questions. Thank you. Many thanks, Edward. We are now going to have Renee, who is going to uh, tell us about the key findings of the European Climate Foundation Zero Carbon Building Report. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here at this, uh, this webinar on, um, for, on a local approach. The, in the next five minutes, I will present us a very brief snapshot of the results of an ECF commissioned uh, study that was published early uh, 2020 on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions of the residential building sector to zero by 2050. And the study was led by C Delft and the modeling was done by Climax. Um, okay, oops, yes, there we are. Okay, so, as we all know, and as Carlos also said, European, we're in, in Europe, European Union, you are not on a pathway to full decarbonization of the building sector by 2050. If you're looking at current scenarios, the EU reference scenarios, greenhouse gas emission reductions from the, green, from the residential building sector will only have decreased by 30% by 2050. So, and as Carlos also said, it's impossible to decarbonize the whole economy 
without a building sector. And it is necessary to decarbonize the whole economy. So um, we've asked um, Climact uh, to develop a zero carbon scenario for the residential built environment using the EU CALC model. And this model models the emissions at European level and it includes different levers that influence emissions. And these levers were grouped in five main areas of building sector emissions. And this you can see in the left. Space heating and cooling by far the largest part, hot water, cooking, appliances and embedded emissions. So, and it is clear from the figure on the right, in the right here we see from the modeling, the possible emission reduction for building envelope, heating fuel switch, appliance efficiency, renewable electricity, and decarbonized materials to get us to zero. It's clear that we need to um, do everything together um, to reach uh, zero carbon. And also, these, if it's also clear that the most important areas for reducing emissions in the building sector are the building envelope, uh, heating fuel switch, so decarbonized uh, heating, and reducing embedded emissions in building materials. But then, if you look at the next slide, you see here we've grouped uh, the five areas of emission uh, reduction, building envelope, heating fuel switch, appliances, electricity, and building materials, and put the current in green, the current European uh, level policies that have been agreed so far and are implemented that target those aspects. For building envelope, you have performance requirements for new buildings and for major renovation, but there's nothing for existing buildings uh, when they're not renovated. Heating, heating fuel switch, there are efficiency standards for heating appliances under eco design. There's nothing on fuels appliances. Yes, there is eco design and energy labeling. So in principle, you have uh, uh, you have a good instrument there. For le electricity, there is the emission trading system. So that is also an, a policy instrument that might, uh, that if uh, strengthened, could, uh, could work for embedded, for building emissions and embedded materials. There's a, of course, there's the ETS sectors that set a cap on the production of materials, but there's not, nothing on life cycle emission reduction. So as this table illustrates, what you see here is the binding regulations are lacking in current European policies in the three areas with the largest emission uh, reduction potential, the building envelope, heating fuel switch, and building materials. So I think that's a major problem. You might think we have 30 years toward, uh, before we have to, um, to introduce all these policies in future. But if you're looking at the lifetime of investment, here you see the lifetime of heating appliances, it's 15 to 20 years, electric appliances, but gas or other, or a district heating uh, distribution network has a lifetime of 50 years or more and new residential building as well. So you can say that we have very few investment cycles to uh, until 2050. And so it is necessary to take measures now to avoid unnecessary higher costs for the energy transition in the future. And, uh, and then if you look at trigger points for investments, so natural moments to upgrade the building or the infrastructure, such as the sale of a building or the change of uh, tenants or um, upgrading the heating system, there you see that there are not that many more anymore anymore so if we aim for a least cost for society approach and reduce the hassle factor for citizens and business alike we have to delay uh, we cannot delay action anymore we have to take action now so i'm coming to their recommendations already mind you this was a a six-month report which i'm trying to uh, summarize in, in five minutes so all the nuances are uh, there are no nuances in uh, my presentation sorry so we think that it is urgent that the renovation wave, besides announcing support schemes to incentivize building renovation, that it includes policy measures that target the building envelope and the heating system, and that allow capturing the natural moments uh, of investment as much as we can. So therefore, I'm focusing on the building envelope and heating fuel switch. We think that for the building envelope, so renovation, I think, it, we think it's very important to introduce minimum energy performance requirements um, to increase the rate of renovation 
and adaptive renovation, at least at the point of sale of a building, a change of a tenant, but probably also at, uh, at fixed moments in time. And these requirements need to be strengthened over time. Several countries already have introduced them, such as the Netherlands, Belgium, France is planning to introduce it, the UK, so it's not, uh, it's not any rocket science. So then if you're looking at uh, the heating fuel switch, there are a number of, um, uh, of recommendations. First, uh, from 2021 on, all new buildings have to be nearly zero energy because of the requirement of the energy performance of buildings are active. That means that those buildings will have a very low energy demand. There is no need uh, to connect those buildings to any fossil fuels. So we suggest to introduce a ban on fossil fuels for using in new buildings. Several countries have already done that. The UK will do it from 2025 on. The Netherlands has already introduced it. Um, there, are, there are a few uh, more. I think Ireland is planning, but I'm not really sure. Um, then I think there's also, if we're serious about decarbonizing the building stock, there is also a need to phase out new fossil fuel heating systems over time. These things have a lifetime of 15 to 20 years, the individual um, heating systems. And if we keep adding more problems, uh, new problems, then uh, we're, not, we're not on a path, we'll never get on a pathway to decarbonizing or we increase the cost very highly. We also think that there needs to be a cap on CO2 emissions of energy carriers for the retail energy suppliers. So uh, a cap on the total um, CO2 emissions. This is different from the, um, from the ETS. It would be a separate system, um, but it would incentivize uh, retail energy suppliers to decarbonize their heating uh, supply. And we think it's very important that, well, in the end, it's municipalities. Uh, it's a local approach that is, um, that is key for, uh, for heating, for decarbonizing heating. And we think that local or regional energy, uh, re regional heating plans are needed to really implement the electrification of heating and district heating. And I saw that in the second part of uh, this webinar, there's a presentation from the Netherlands and I expect that I will um, introduce it. And furthermore, of course, there is a need of supporting policies. We need financial support um, for renovations for a heating fuel switch to accelerate this change and to alleviate energy poverty, but also to help create a market um, and, and reduce the cost. And also, as Carl has also already said, we need one-stop shops for citizens and a lot of technical assistance for municipalities because this is a long-term process. And I would say that we don't need one renovation wave. We need wave after wave after wave after wave. I'll stop there and I look forward to uh, your questions and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee, for this very interesting presentation. We're now moving to Susanna, who is going to focus on the local expert synergies between renovation and the heat supply. Hi, thank you uh, for inviting me also. And uh, it's really nice to follow from Renee because I think that a lot of what she talks about really resonates with the research that we've done in projects like Key Roadmap Europe. And it's especially good to see that these things are finding their way into uh, the, the shape that this renovation wave is going to take, where it's really a combination of renovations and also addressing the supply of the buildings, which we know to be extremely important uh, to actually achieve full decarbonization. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the local aspect. There will be a lot of that later on as well. Um, so I think that focusing on the synergies that exist uh, on a very local level without going deeply into the policies um, is a useful angle to have. Um, I think one point that comes out very strongly from looking at the combination of renovations and heat supply at a local level is that it is partially important to do both um, because they strengthen each other also at a local level. By renovating, it becomes easier to decarbonize the heat supply. And by decarbonizing the heat supply, it becomes easier and more cost effective to do the renovations at the same time. So these are self-increasing self mechanisms in certain set of elements. Um, when talking about how to do this on a local level, I think that it's useful to differentiate between two distinct approaches. One of them is to take a district approach. Um, 
I think, Carlos, you mentioned a neighborhood approach, but that's basically what we're talking about here. Uh, a good example that comes from Denmark that's been studied pretty extensively by academics because it was part of uh, a funded project on investigating how fourth generation district heating comes about and how we can include these renovations with uh, low heat supply um, is Albertslund, which is basically in the suburbs of Copenhagen. Um, and where there was an ambition, not so much driven actually by energy efficiency, but more by increasing the socioeconomic uh, perception of the area. And um, it was really a kind of, you know, street by street. approach and uh, renovate the network itself, put in new pipes in doing so, be able uh, to integrate more renewables. So I think that that's the kind of, you know, neighborhood approach, the street by street combination of doing everything at the same time, which works um, extremely well. Uh, similar kind of neighborhood approaches exist uh, here in Denmark as well when it comes to transferring neighborhoods from typically gas um, to district heating and a model that's been used quite extensively here and that I think is popping up more and more in other places is the kind of lease of a boiler. So if a district heating company sees that they will be expanding into this area, um, but not yet, they will take uh, in some cases responsibility for heating your house with that certain boiler until they are ready to do so. And that allows them to be able to prepare a neighborhood before actually moving in. Um, and that brings this kind of time lag that comes sometimes from this district approach where you're trying to align a lot of different households and a lot of different businesses together. Um, so those I think are good examples of how taking a neighborhood approach can really help you both do renovations at the same time and uh, at the same time decarbonize your heat supply. And in urban areas where most neighborhoods are, uh, that is, you know, I think we're looking more and more at district heating as the solution for those types of areas. So in terms of targeted approaches, um, I think this is also something that someone has mentioned, but that requires a lot of local knowledge. So examples can be, for example, looking at the most, uh, well, utilities typically call them problematic users, but the users that have a lot of uh, demand that doesn't really explain itself easily. So, uh, for example, looking at your one top 1% 1 consumers and then individually approaching them and finding out why that's the case. Is there a reason for that? Or is it something that can be addressed by uh, helping them implement some kind of renovation or helping them implement some kind of other energy saving? And that's very useful for utilities because by addressing that top 1% or those top 100 users, Typically, you can start lowering temperatures in your network. Um, and as we go towards more electrification, that is also going to be important because with heat pumps, um, trying to reduce that peak capacity is what then puts the pressure on your grid. So if you have an established network, then taking that kind of local approach of trying to find who are the people that are, or who are the buildings rather, because often it's also companies that are involved uh, spread out through the neighborhood that are causing problems with your network. Um, the other option of a very targeted approach is looking at ownership. And it's nice to hear that energy poverty uh, is one of the key elements that's in here because those are the types of buildings where on a local level, um, it's important to have a more targeted approach and go by them and see them and see what can be done and what the options are. Um, that can be in terms of ownership, that can be, you know, if you say we're going to start by looking at all the buildings that are publicly owned, of course, but also then by looking at all the buildings that have been rented for certain times or all the buildings that are in some kind of uh, housing cooperative, that's also an easy way of starting to address a lot of these issues quickly. Um, and which facilitates a very holistic approach in terms of both doing the renovations and doing something about the heat supply at the same time. So I think those are the two uh, kind of ways that it's really possible to start looking at local synergies um, without necessarily identifying the policies that support them. 
what does this mean for the renovation wave? Because it's still, I think as Carla said, it's still a bit opaque what's in it necessarily. Um, I think, and this is a bit, you know, this is without knowing what it is, there are two elements that come out of it that are really important to be able to introduce. The first is that, you know, we talk about all the financing that's needed and that these things are cost effective, but that they don't happen. And a lot of that is because there is so much work in the coordination. Um, I have a colleague who does research on, you know, everyone talks about these energy planners. Uh, so we tried to find who these energy planners are. And when it comes to heat, because it's a very diverse sector and because in Europe we have a very diverse way of organizing what, what power local authorities have and what they address and how they address it. Um, it's very difficult to find the energy planner which is good because it's an interdisciplinary area so they should be closely linked to other places but it is important to know that there are people and to facilitate the spaces for the people to exist to be able to do this work at the local level um, it's in some ways a very counterintuitive job because you know you don't necessarily want to have someone sitting there for heating specifically because it is the built environment and it is the energy supply and it is the urban planning but it's important to be able to create those coordinating roles at a local level that um, can facilitate the data requirements for this and that can understand where the heat demands are, where the heat supplies are, and that can bring these kind of collaborations uh, to be. And I think that brings me to the second point that what really needs to be included is the role of the tradespeople that are involved in this. Um, when we talk about this gap between the 11% of renovations that occur in general and the low amount of energy that, are, that occurs, the people who are really closest to that and the people who are really informing the consumers on that um, are the tradespeople. And to be honest, when it comes to heating, the people who can really provide the really hyper local solutions when it comes to where are your radiators, where are your windows, how do we connect this, how do we put the pipe through your garden, are also the local tradespeople. Um, and their role in that is not to be underestimated. Um, we're currently writing a paper on the gas transition in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, um, basically in the 60s, the whole country was hooked up to gas. And part of that was the transition from low calorific gas to high calorific gas. And uh, the framework of that is really, you know, a team of people who comes to every house and knows how to both inform the consumers and be able to provide these solutions, but also how to technically convert your appliances. And um, I think that's something that's very important to be able to include. We talk about, you know, creating local employment, but that also means investing in those local employee, employees and those local people. And um, I think they will in the end be the ones who get us off the gas because if they're used to installing gas boilers and will continue to do so for the next 20 years, then we're not going to go anywhere. So that, uh, that very local interaction with both the consumer and also the technical solution that's required in the building, I think is very important. So um, that's a bit my perspective on how to create that synergy between the local level. Um, but again, it's very, you know, when we talk about this renovation wave as uh, following up from the heat strategy from 2015 and following up from the previous energy efficiency directives and the energy performance of the building directives, it's very good to see this link between what's being done on the renovation level and then also what's being done in terms of the heat supply because that's that's where we'll be making gains hopefully so if you have any questions i look forward to them and uh thanks again for inviting me thank you very much susanna um before we move to q a i would invite all the speakers to please turn their cameras on again so everyone can see us and so yes perfect thanks so much so it's clear from this uh, your presentation that i i wrote down three key elements that emerge from the discussion first of all it, it's clear that um, building renovation is not enough to reach the energy efficiency targets that we also need to look at uh, other solution and especially we need to look at the the carbonizing and the heat supply we need to do that in uh, taking a district approach because that's the most efficient way to do so. 
Uh, and also it's key to work with the local authorities because they bring in already uh, best practice and case study that could be useful and they could be applied in, a, in, a, in, a, in other places as well. So again, thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to, I have a question for, for you, Carlis. Um, so what's, if you can tell, uh, what would be the role, what, which role would they play the cities and local authorities in this renovation wave? Well, thank you. I think it's a very fundamental question here because I think what the Commission is trying to untangle is the different uh, levels of competences that uh, are there associated to building renovation. And it is a big uh, playing field. It's a mix of different uh, policy areas. So there's no way of underestimating the local uh, effect. And I think Susanna gave some very practical examples uh, that can be used at the municipal uh, level, either by utilities or by authorities to uh, try and uh, identify what the possible challenges are and then uh, offering the solutions. Uh, what the Commission can do here is to provide a supporting uh, framework. I mean, uh, if we look at, for example, the next uh, MFF and uh, next generation EU funding, then the idea there is uh, that a significant uh, amount should go to climate uh, mainstreaming. Uh, on top of that, in the Recovery and Resilience Fund and in uh, uh, most uh, areas such as uh, regional funding, in, uh, in funding for research and development, uh, all of these options offer eligibility for energy infrastructures in developing uh, them depending on the rules of, of these uh, instruments. So uh, what we would like to maybe do and improve in the future is to try and make these, uh, this type of support available at a more granular level. So we see that member states are key in driving the, the transition. Um, but we'd also like to suggest that uh, EU and the member states team up in funding so that uh, the EU knows better how to channel if there's anything we can do through the EIP, for example, uh, down to a closer local level. And by saying this, uh, we, I already mentioned this, but uh, support for technical assistance and the creation of one-stop shops and if you're familiar with the Elena facility, which basically is uh, also technical assistance pro for preparing uh, projects with a high bankability uh, potential, then setting up similar uh, solutions also on, on subnational level with the cooperation of the relevant authorities. These are the ideas that we want to look at to make uh, things really operational on the ground. Thank you very much, Carlis. I'm sure there are other questions for you, but before to, I, I will read them, but I just have other few questions, if you don't mind, especially one for Rene. Uh, because in, the, in your presentation, you mentioned that there will be a key role uh, to be played by district heating, and actually will be key to introduce local uh, heating plants with obligation for district heating to cut emissions. So I wanted to ask you if you could please elaborate a bit more on that. And maybe also, given that you are based in the Netherlands, if you could also provide some, maybe the, the Dutch example of what they're doing now to phase, uh, to phase out uh, gas. Okay. Um, so there is one important um, aspect of decarbonization of building is European level legislation. But in the end, it is, it is at a local level that the real changes have to happen. And we all know that heating is very much a, a local issue. So at the European level, you can set a framework, but I think in the end, uh, well, Susanna is, more, is much more an expert on that uh, than I am. But in the end, uh, the solutions have to be implemented at local level and they're very uh, specific. So um, 
if you empower municipalities and regional governments to develop local and regional heating plans, looking at um, the demand for heating, and I, I like very much what Susanna said, look at the 1% users with the highest energy demand. That's something indeed that needs to be ha happened at a local level. But then also look at where are sources of supply? Is there some uh, waste heat from industry, from uh, server centers or, uh, or such um, geothermal availability? And then develop local heat plants um, to decide how to source which neighborhood with what type of uh, heating. Uh, you know, heat pumps will play, uh, and electrification of heating will play a very large role in the, uh, in the heat transition as we see that in all scenarios. But fourth generation district heating is um, also a very, will also be a very important and, and good solution uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for several cities, for densely populated uh, uh, places. And in the Netherlands, I know there is a speaker from the Netherlands later on, so she will be much better than, I, uh, than me to uh, work on this. But in the Netherlands, there are, there's an agreement, uh, political agreement, to phase out gas for heating by 2050. And all municipalities now have to develop plans, local heat plans, to, um, to decide which neighborhoods will, be, will phase out of gas by when and for the neighborhoods until 2050, but also and for the neighborhoods that phase out of gas until 2030, also already an alternative source of heating will have to be uh, provided and, uh, and plans will have to be uh, developed. So I think that's, um, that is one option to do it, but I'm sure there are, uh, there are many different options. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Renee. And Susanna, please feel free if you also want to jump in and provide more uh, information. Or otherwise, I, also, I will also have a question for you. Well, there's one thing I might want to add. I think that in a lot of these cases, when we talk about the local things being done, um, you know, there's a bit of an implicit assumption that it's the local municipality themselves doing it. But in a lot of cases, we've learned that that's not the case, um, both in Europe, but also globally. Um, so the empowerment of municipalities, I think, is important because, you know, we've talked a lot and there have been a lot of European projects actually within the last horizon calls to empower local municipalities by providing them data and providing them methodologies and approaches. But uh, finally, uh, in the end, these, these plans are often made also by consultants. So empowering them is also about um, being able to, to manage these processes. Um, and I think that that requires both very technical knowledge, but on the other hand, really kind of interdisciplinary approach that recognizes the role of uh, the local governance aspect. Um, so I think that that's something that is really being pioneered in the Netherlands in a way that's, that's very useful. Um, and for other countries to also look at, I'm also Dutch. I live in Denmark and I work for Danish university, but that's, why I add that. Thank you. And Susanna, since you're here, there's a, there's a question from the public asking, what is the ownership structure of heat providers in Denmark? And maybe Hedvard, you can also jump in on this one. Uh, yeah, it's, um, so heat is provided in Denmark very much by district heating. There are also individual solutions. There are also gas solutions. Um, and this is all governed by a fairly rigorous uh, methodology on, on how to do the heat planning. In terms of the ownership structure, it's a little controversial here. There is a lot of cooperative ownership in district heating companies, basically because of the, the history of how they evolved. Um, and uh, that's some kind of form of consumer ownership, which has proved very productive in terms of uh, you know, expanding and being able to have that consumer buy-in and um, preventing, uh, preventing kind of private, the kind of suspicion that comes from private ownership and at the same time giving local uh, municipalities some kind of say in how it happens. Um, that having been said, there is no need for Danish district heating companies to be uh, cooperatively owned. There are also privately owned um, district heating companies and um, those are governed also fairly rigorously in the sense that 
they cannot really run away with the profits uh, that they make. You know, they're a private ownership of a public utility, so they are regulated fairly heavily. Um, so both exist, but the predominance is the cooperative simply because that's how they, they kind of evolved, um, particularly in the 50s and then afterwards in the kind of second wave in the 60s and 70s. Thank you so much. There's an echo. Uh, Edward, would you also like to respond on this one? Uh, and then I have a question for you. Sure. I mean, I think I think Susanna covered really the ownership um, uh, sort of uh, norms in in Denmark, but I think it's one of the reasons why uh, district heating has been so successful in Denmark is partly because of the ownership structure, and of course partly because of the um, of the sort of governance and and commitment to um, district heating from um, along succession of, of Danish governments. Um, and I think that this is um, not so much the ownership structure, but just the, the policy advantages of having a robust district sector and seeing it not only as a local um, uh, issue, it's a local heating issue, but many of our, much of our district heating is provided by uh, combined heat and power plants. And this provides a, a, an overriding influence on how the electricity sector has also developed in um, Denmark and um, one shouldn't divine the the role that district heating plays in not only being a um, using renewable energy itself but it, it plays a, a significant role in providing flexibility to the um, overriding uh, power grid um, through heat storage um, and, and this has allowed us to integrate much higher levels of wind uh, power together with uh, other initiatives uh, than we ever believed really technically possible looking back at planning 10, 15 years ago. So energy efficiency, at least um, district heating not only can provide opportunities at the local level, but it can also provide um, opportunities at a national or a regional level um, and many of these um, opportunities actually have um, made district heating or the actual heating more um, inexpensive for the consumer because it provides income from outside of the local community as well. Here I am. Thank you, Edward. And actually, this is also linked to what you mentioned before, uh, referring to the council conclusion the need for uh, implementing and improving this reheating system, which is a position not only uh, taken by the Danish uh, government, but also by other member states. Maybe for those who are not familiar with that, could you please elaborate a bit more on these messages? Well, just to, to put it into to context, we, um, under the Croatian presidency, um, um, there was a, a council conclusions adopted on green, uh, recovery uh, within the energy sector and within those counter conclusions there was a strong um, drive from from a number of member states mostly um, the Nordic member states uh, the Baltics and then the central and southeastern European member states who already have district heating networks um, that would um, that wanted to see the renovation wave include the opportunity for local um, governments or uh, to improve their their heating systems, and I think this is um, this is an initiative that that we uh, were very active in. But the uh, the focus of the initiative is not on um, countries or member states as such as Denmark or Sweden. The real drive was because we see huge potential for reducing energy bills and improving energy efficiency and reducing carbon footprints. Um, of heating in um, especially Central uh, and Southeastern Europe, um, where, where the funds um, uh, just aren't uh, available in the same way as they are in some of the, the, the member states with a higher GDP, uh, and one needs a push because district heating is not a high value um, energy industry, such as natural gas or um, oil. Uh, these are, are not um, um, uh, highly profitable or very seldom highly profitable um, um, 
businesses selling hot water to people, uh, mostly because most of the people using these hot water are just either normal or normal people like, like ourselves, and often as well low income uh, people living in, in large um, apartment blocks. So we feel that there should be um, assistance to local governments to really get close to the people who actually need help in, um, in the, the green transition, in improving their um, lives and being able to see it benefit at a local level. And, and we feel that district heating definitely ticks those boxes. And uh, we had 17 other member states who felt the same. And in, in uh, including the Netherlands, actually, which has a very low level of, of district heating, but is, is looking at it. Um, and, and in the, the fact that no other member states opposed this, I think, shows that, that, that the benefits for the, across the union were recognized uh, in, in council. Thank you very much, Edward. I mean, conscious of time, I won't be able to read all the questions that we have received, unfortunately. But I see Susanna wanted to answer to Nick, who is asking, from my understanding, these reheating networks tend to add more permanent jobs for operating and maintenance. Is there enough labor available now for this position to extend this local initiative required? Um, yeah, you're muted. That helps. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, it's I'm not a macroeconomist, but from what we kind of look at and what we see at a local level is that it's, I don't necessarily think that there's a very strong argument that district heating provides more jobs in terms of operation and maintenance, but there's a very clear shift along the value chain because what you're no longer doing is you're no longer going door to door and selling gas boilers. You're no longer going door to door and selling, you know, pellet burners or heat pumps. What you're doing instead is you're really investing in the infrastructure itself and then in the supply of that. So it's a shift in jobs very strongly um, and you know when we talk about creating jobs then the obvious answer is well are those are those people there um, and the challenge in that I think is that we're we're at the point where we have to switch also the education systems and you know the the knowledge of these technical people um, and that the role of being like the VVS guy is no longer that you install the gas boiler, but that it's you have knowledge of other things. Um, so it's a re-education. And to be honest, I think that that fits really well with this kind of um, renovation wave that we're talking about. But also Carlos was earlier mentioning that there's a reconstruction fund. Um, well, let's not use the word fund, but there's a reconstruction element uh, coming from the European level, but also at the local level, at the member state level, there's a lot of countries that are talking about how to um, be able to use the the new financial space that's being opened up by the need to address what's kind of happening globally um, in a way that it can address the green transition. And I think that that's a very strong part of it. That it's not so much about do we do we have people for those jobs, and you know when we create those jobs, how do we fill them? but about answering that question. And I think that that's very much about changing the role of what the local technician is that comes to your house. Because if we're being honest, I think that that's in the end, the person who's going to sell you on the idea of doing energy renovation is the guy that sees your window and sees your roof and sees your basement um, and sees what kind of supply you have that can bring that. Um, so that's hopefully an answer to your question. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you all. Does anyone would like to give the final remark because we need to close? Yes, Carlis, please go ahead. Thank you. I will be very brief because I'm also conscious of the time. But there was one of the uh, questions which I think ties nicely to what Susanna just said from Carol asking about what uh, do, do we see that there's a crowding out between the COVID uh, pandemic and then uh, the actual need for renovation. And I'd like to add one element here, which I think uh, is uh, implicit, but I want to make this explicit. We have been speaking about uh, examples in, in renovation and decarbonizing uh, heat supplies. And uh, we have speaking about, uh, speaking about the Danish and the Dutch examples. And this might seem like sort of uh, an issue for the chosen few. 
I would like to say no, because uh, it, uh, heat deliveries will be the question and decarbonization of buildings will be the question for the entire EU, all member states. We're not speaking about exclusively a couple of examples. Um, and a very important point is what Edward mentioned, that the energy transition uh, really materializes on a citizen level through heating and cooling. Uh, in a way, that's uh, although we put uh, solar PV on our roofs, we create on-site uh, energy and that's visible to all. The uh, invisible part is the heating and cooling part, which uh, can be delivered through pipes. And uh, this is what we hope that through renovation, uh, irrespective of how much heat you actually deliver to the building, uh, that will make the energy transition visible and the benefits felt. And about the exclusiveness of one or the other, I'd just like to say that it's really up to the member states to decide what types of measures they use in order to uh, get out of the economic downturn. And there are good examples, for example, for, from the Mediterranean countries that use uh, eco-bonus programs so that uh, companies can uh, have favorable tax reductions if they invest and do action into the renovation of buildings. So it really depends on the, the culture and the setup of uh, countries. But it's not to say that if there is something that has been uh, successful in Denmark, and similar results could not be reached in other parts of the EU, possibly using a different uh, mix. And this is, uh, I believe, what Susanna is also underlining, that you really need to have the people on the ground that understand what's, uh, what works and what doesn't. And for the Commission, one of the things we'd like to look at as a possible avenue are energy audits, I mean, as a tool, because that's a way to get the information about what can be done uh, to a, a building owner, an occupant, to a municipality. So sorry for being a bit long, but I think I, I wanted to make this point. Extremely useful. Many thanks, Carlis. Uh, many thanks, all. Just being conscious of time, the next session starts in five minutes. <laughs> so um, uh, we have to finish now. I just want to thank you all again, and thank you to the participants for their comments and their contribution. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we were not able to answer all of the questions, but should you want to still address them to the speakers, feel free to send it to us and we will make sure that you can respond at a later stage. So thank you so much and we'll see you soon. My name is Sophia Lettenbichler and I'm a colleague of Julia's. I'm also working at Euro Heat and Power and leading the work on cities there. So I'm also active in the Celsius initiative and it's my pleasure to moderate the second session. We have one hour to discuss with some, let's say, local leaders on the front lines um, and they will tell us how they would like to see the renovation wave. Um, during this session, we will look at what's going on on the ground in Europe already. So basically, there are already cities and regions that um, have some type of approaches on the renovation wave and the heat transition going on. Um, and as we heard in the previous session, the Commission has basically underlined that they would like to provide a supporting framework for these regional leaders. So I'm very pleased to discuss with our panelists today their wishes and their needs, what they would need from the renovation wave. At the same time, we are of course not starting from scratch. There are already quite uh, a lot of projects and initiatives going on that we will hear from today namely local district level approaches um, where, for example, heat network pilots and also renovations go hand in hand. All right, that's enough from me for now. Without further ado, I would actually like to hand over to the first panelist, who is Fritz Verhesen. She is the energy project leader at the city of Antwerp. And as you might know, the city of Antwerp is one of the front runner cities when it comes to the energy transition in Belgium. She will tell us a little bit more about the heat planning that they have been doing for a couple of years now and some exciting projects that are about to start. Please, Brit, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Sophia, also for inviting me to speak at this very interesting webinar. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Brit Verhesen and I work for the city of Antwerp around strategic energy planning. Um, as a city, we aim for 100% CO2 reduction in 2050, but today we still use uh, some 90% fossil fuels for our heating and cooling system, uh, most of it's individual gas boilers, and we also have a lot of historical buildings with low installation, so 
uh, enough challenges to tackle. Um, I agree that an important focus is renovating the old buildings to reduce the heating consumption. Um, I have a lot of colleagues in the city of Antwerp from at Eco House who operate on multiple projects, for example, renovation coaches, also part of the Be Real project, um, to try and accelerate the renovation, but it's not going as fast as we hope. Uh, the investment is too heavy for the average family in the city. There is a high poverty rate in Antwerp and there are a lot of tenants, so um, that, that's a problem. The legislation in Antwerp is complex. It's not always easy to get access to the right support channels. Um, and with our protected historical buildings, it makes an energy renovation much more difficult. So we also focus on decarbonizing the existing, existing heating and cooling systems. So the supply side of the energy transition, which was uh, mentioned earlier also by the speakers. Um, we have set up a heat zoning plan where, where you can see um, each neighborhood what the best energy concept is on a high scale. Um, district heating network, that is a favorable concept in a lot of zones in Antwerp. We have a unique location because we have um, a lot of excess heat from our petrochemical harbor. And we are a really dense built city, so theoretically perfect for district heating network. With these results, we set up an action plan district heating to really put it into practice. We defined nine pilot zones, um, which are very favorable for district heating based on different criteria. Also, one of the cr criteria is um, zones where there are a lot of city buildings and social housing clusters, um, where we think that we can easily go into the district heating. Um, the pilot zones are the ones you see on the map. So it's uh, for illustration uh, what it looks like. In these zones, we, uh, work, we are working towards an investment decision on the short term. So in four years, we want um, a decision for all the nine pilot zones. And we're making this decision with strategic partners on board. Uh, also the TSO and uh, the Port of Antwerp is, uh, is one of the partners. In the plan, everyone has a clear role and um, everyone takes the lead in certain, certain tasks to really get to that decision. What we already see as an obstacle is financing the larger connecting networks. We do need support to succeed in these projects for these kind of infrastructural works. Um, the point that I want to make, and I think that all the speakers have mentioned it already, um, is that the goal should be reducing the CO2 emissions, not just the heating consumption of the individual buildings. It's important to allocate the available resources in the most efficient way. Um, the optimal approach is probably a combination of measures which, which all lead to decarbonizing the system. Uh, I, I think that now there is a strong focus on the individual buildings and thereby the individual, which is also important, but I do think that a more district approach could be more efficient um, and more people could be reached. I'm glad to hear Carlis say uh, that one of the focus of the renovation wave is the neighborhood approach. Um, and also what Edward said about the holistic approach of the total picture, um, I agree uh, with these remarks. A district, district approach can be adopted in many ways. For example, what could be interesting in Antwerp is setting up different support policies uh, for the different zone in the city. So this, this can be connected to a strategic energy plan and it could lead to more um, efficient investment. Maybe a last remark. I agree with, uh, with Rene, the phase out of new fossil fuel heating systems is, uh, is missing now. And I think that the phase out could really lead um, to an acceleration of the transition uh, like it does in the Netherlands. Um, so these were my short uh, minutes about our project. Um, I hope to get some questions of you. I'm looking forward and I give the word back to uh, Sophia. Yes, thank you so much, Brit. Very interesting, and uh, thanks a lot for sharing your your insights. Indeed, you can still uh, ask your questions in the Q and A panel, and we're happy to take them up. So please don't hesitate. All right, now I would like to hand over the word to Tomislav Novosel, who is project manager at the Northwest Croatia Regional Energy Agency, Regea, and. Uh, it's basically an agency that supports their local authorities to decarbonize the whole energy system and let's say they're pioneers and setting standards across the country as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about the energy and climate planning of one of their um, member cities, namely the city of Karlovac in Croatia? 
please tell me stuff the floor is yours thank you very much sofia for the for the kind introduction uh croatia is probably not the first country that comes to mind when we discuss uh, regions with advanced energy planning i would really like to tell you that you're wrong but unfortunately you probably aren't uh, however there are some very positive changes that are happening right now and there are quite a few positive uh, preconditions that, uh, that do exist in Croatia for this to actually change. Um, first and foremost, Croatian cities are very, very uh, active or at least have a high participation rate in the Covenant of Mayors. So a lot of them have sustainable uh, energy action plans and quite a few of them are making the steps to transform them into sustainable energy and climate action plans. Uh, and on the other hand, mayors also usually have a very positive outlook when it comes to uh, energy and they all want to see their cities become green, become modern, become smart uh, and become, let's say, futuristic, at least for Croatian standards. Uh, there is, however, a lack of uh, implementation of, of these visions and also, unfortunately, of the various plans that the cities have. And there are three key barriers that uh, basically prevent this. Uh, two of them are, well, one of them is, is, is probably fairly obvious, and that is a lack of fund. Uh, lack of funds and that is something that will hopefully change. I'm very glad to hear that uh, Southeast Europe and Central Europe uh, are in the focus of the renovation wave and I hope that that will help us uh, quite a bit. Uh, the second one is a distorted uh, energy market. So unfortunately gas and fossil fuels are, are fairly cheap uh, in, in, in Croatia. Uh, heat from district heating is also cheap compared to European standards but unfortunately not as cheap as gas. Uh, so this distorts the uh, profitability of investment into energy efficiency, uh, but that is also slowly changing. And uh, finally, the third one, and this is actually the issue that we are uh, going to address with the project that we are implementing in Karlovac, and that is a lack of capacity to develop obligatory plans and what's more important, uh, actually implement them. Uh, so what exactly am I talking about? Uh, the, the city of Karlovac, for example, has a sustainable energy and climate action plan, but unfortunately it is a voluntary action and there are no repercussions for, uh, for the city or uh, the city inhabitants uh, not following it. Uh, however, there is a document that the city has and that the city develops that is obligatory and the city has a lot of experience using it. And that, that is basically spatial and zoning plans. And the key idea behind this project is to actually integrate uh, the, the sustainable energy and climate action plan, as well as all of, or most of the energy and climate measures that are uh, planned within it into the city's spatial and uh, zoning plans. Uh, uh, this initiative was started by the city itself and we're, we're very happy that we didn't have to push too much for this idea to go through, uh, but it was actually brought by them and the image that you're looking at is one of the primary reasons why. Uh, what you're seeing here is basically the distribution of the city's district heating, uh, red, and natural gas, green uh, lines, uh, both uh, active and or sorry uh, the ones that exist and ones that are planned and what you can unfortunately see here is a lot of overlap uh, this is something that, this is only one of the, the issues that we would actually like to address with this plan so for example uh, Croatia doesn't have uh, the a tradition of setting uh, heating zones. So uh, basically project developers are free to connect to whichever heating source uh, they want and gas is the most popular. This is something that has to change by 2050 and if this is for example something that is set, set out clearly within a, a spatial and zoning plan, uh, developers won't really have much of an option to select gas if uh, district heating is available or they will at least have to use uh, some other uh, low carbon or renewable uh, source uh, of heating. Uh, additionally to this, uh, through the utilization of, of this approach, we will be able to uh, implement uh, zones of uh, low carbon intensity or even ban the use of fossil fuels in certain zones and hopefully after a while within uh, the entire city. This is uh, examples of similar actions can be seen throughout Europe, for example, uh, Vienna and their environmental protection zones, uh, if, I'm, if I remember the name correctly, uh, that they are uh, implementing in some of their districts. Uh, this in our opinion, goes even one step further because uh, they will be integrated directly into the uh, spatial and zoning plans and will not be an additional uh, document. If I'm uh, saying anything wrong about uh, Vienna, I apologize. Uh, 
Uh, but anyway, uh, the implementation of this approach will hopefully help uh, the city of Karlovac transition into a uh, green smart city. And we also hope that this initiative will, uh, will help other cities implement uh, similar actions. Uh, so yeah, this was my introduction. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to post them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tomislav. Very interesting approach indeed and uh, very timely because as you said correctly, we already talked about the need to focus on South and Eastern Europe um, especially. Um, having talked about this, there was also another country that was mentioned multiple times already in the previous session and that was the Netherlands because of your pioneering gas-free approach. And I'm really pleased to invite the next speaker who is Maya van der Steenhoven. I would say one of the thought leaders of the energy and especially the heat transition in the Netherlands. She has led the program office Heat and Cold South Holland for years and she'll provide insights from the Dutch perspective on the gas-free program. Over to you, Maya. Okay, in Holland we have uh, nine building, nine million buildings uh, uh, that need to go of gas by 2050 which is quite an interesting uh, approach so we put uh, we took it uh, uh, totally big uh, we're not just looking at one city or one place uh, 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 we're going everywhere and now oh, yeah. and of course we're not doing it all at the same time because that would mean like uh, uh, 400,000 buildings a year already now. So we started with, we start low with some uh, pilots and then we go faster and faster. You can see this there. And the interesting thing is that we started talking officially about going off gas in 2015. We're now in 2020 and we're still talking about it. The, the things that really happened is that new buildings have uh, uh, been forbidden to go on gas, which doesn't mean that no new buildings go on gas, but at least you have to uh, uh, get a, a free pass from the city that you're allowed to build on gas and otherwise you won't be able to. And the other thing that we have is that the social housing corporations have said that they will be like an engine for this uh, uh, movement and that they will do 100,000 houses in the coming years of gas, which is existing uh, uh, buildings. Then, and the other thing we're doing until 2021 is that every city has to come up with a heat plan. It means that in every city people are talking about, and they also have to come up with an, an energy plan. So they're talking about where are we going to get our uh, and place our windmills? Where are we going to put our sun panels? Where are, uh, and do we then have enough electricity? How is our electricity grid? Can we even uh, electrify in the current uh, 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 infrastructure? And this is an amazing uh, transition of, uh, uh, in cities, there are now uh, uh, 10 or 15 energy experts in every city, which is uh, uh, in the city uh, council or in the uh, uh, city network, which is already, you need that. Otherwise, there's no way you can progress until sustainable, 100% sustainable country, because our network is completely wrong for this. Uh, uh, we don't have place to put anything uh, in the Netherlands because we're a very densely populated country. And even to make changes in the grid will take 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, so five years of planning to go off gas that seemed like a really long plan is already, it's nothing, uh, 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 is what we're finding out. So we are making plans for each city of which area goes of gas first. Uh, uh, we'll go to district heating, we'll go to heat pumps, we'll go to renewable gases, uh, uh, hydrogen. We're looking at that and we're discussing it from a holistic point of view, which you need if you want to go uh, off gas, because it's not just the infrastructure it's not just the uh, uh, prices but it's also the the mind states uh, 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 people have 
really a lot of things on their mind that they want when they go off gas. So they wanted uh, to be their own company or they want it to be something else or it has to be greener than green. So this is also a, a, a complete transition in discussions you have uh, uh, with your population. So we said after 2021, we'll have a step-by-step -step rollout uh, uh, of sustainable, uh, sustainability in the neighborhood. Well, I think that is really optimistic and we're gonna look a long way further before we are actually starting. But the thing is that now we have around 100 uh, 25 pilots in the Netherlands, which is really, really important. These are uh, uh, neighborhoods that have gotten like six or seven million from the government. Uh, everybody is working on it together. Uh, uh, the population, the city, the energy companies to go off gas. And these pilots are just a, a, a learning lab, a living lab, and, and so important for us to do it. Um, and why, uh, uh, I think I was one of the ones that started in 2016 with the campaign to go off gas in the Netherlands. And people said, you're being too soon because uh, uh, you're telling it too soon and you should wait. Well, uh, uh, I would advise everybody and also the EU to start telling it now. Because once you tell people that we're going off gas, also take a big transition period because we thought, well, we can do it in four or five years uh, to start it. Uh, uh, it it's, you cannot. You, your whole technology and systems have to change. Your spatial uh, policy has to change. Your infrastructure, you need to come up with new business models because there are no business models at the moment for uh, the sustainable uh, exit. Your legislation and your regulation has to go upside down. We take at least 10 years to talk and debate about our new heat law, which uh, uh, we need and which will be old once once it goes in uh, uh, in practice because by then we will have find out so many more things that we need but the biggest one is also the human nature and the societal uh, uh, wave um, it, it, it is people are really aware of what is happening they want to be invited to talk about it they, they want to have a say in it and you cannot just roll it out so there's also and it takes years to have this discussion and to and and also have people come up with their own inventions uh, uh, we have uh, uh, neighborhoods that are doing it for themselves right now which is amazing uh, but they are also the ambassadors of this transition too. so take at least seven eight years before you can actually start doing anything which actually would mean that all countries including the eu should already pronounce that we will have a gas exit after let's say 2030 so people can start focusing on that right now uh, municipalities don't lack big ambitions but they lack people knowledge experience and skills and budget and it's not by lack of trying but uh, uh, you can have knowledge of the energy energy system but that doesn't mean you also have knowledge of the legislation of the regulation of human nature of uh, uh, you need to be like an Einstein to to understand what's going on so you have to have a multiple team with everything in it and uh, uh, most uh, cities have like one person that has like uh, three days a week to do this whole transition and yeah it, it, it just doesn't work that way um, what can uh, uh, municipalities do uh, uh, in Holland, we have the, the uh, regional uh, energy strategy and the heat vision uh, before that, which makes sure that people are already talking what is possible. Because people will come up, oh, we want heat pumps. But if you can uh, explain to them that that means a huge change to the grid or uh, uh, that we don't, like in South of Holland, uh, South Holland, we don't have enough electricity, but we have enough heat to uh, uh, heat up like the whole of Netherlands, probably including Belgium, and that we all throw away at the moment. So that gives a, a different vision uh, uh, to people like, oh, but maybe then it's smart to use that heat. Um, 
So, and also you want to talk about local heat sources and you want to be talking about temperatures because people really love small, uh, 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 nice projects, uh, uh, innovative. So you need to have some of those in there also. You need to be uh, also stimulating innovation. If you're just doing the old thing, uh, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, you need to build on the coalitions of the willing. Uh, uh, start with social housing corporations like we're doing and learn from pilots we're also learning a lot from the new buildings which are not allowed to go uh, go on gas and uh, uh, facilitate local groups and make it a holistic, uh, holistic issue this is also about health this is about togetherness this is about uh, uh, so many other things than only heat and people are not that interested in heat they're interested about the other things i think that is my presentation for now um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Maya. And thank you for also touching upon other issues that we will for sure take up in the discussion later on. Uh, for example, the involvement of citizens and, and so on. So I would now like to move to the last presenter, um, who is Adrian Hill from Energy Cities. And you might know Energy Cities represents the most ambitious European cities in the energy transition. So we are especially pleased that Adrian is here with us to share their member cities' views basically on the renovation wave and also your member cities' needs. Um, please, Adrian, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Sophia. Uh, it's good to be here. It's a bit daunting to come to be the last speaker um, after everyone else has covered so much. Um, but you can see there's, there's so many elements involved in this. Uh, from a city's point of view, uh, before you look at the renovation wave, you have to look at the Green Deal as a whole. Um, because there are so many things coming down the pipeline. Uh, with the Green Deal, you've got, um, for cities, you're going to be doing a biodiversity strategy. You've got a smart mobility strategy, which is invariably going to mean digging up the street for you know, car chargers, the digital age, do we need to lay fiber optics around? Farm to fork strategy, cities are going to have a, a role to play there. Forest strategy, it might not seem obvious, but there will be a role for cities there. Smart sector integration, and then you get to the renovation wave. Um, and from a city's point of view, when you look at all these initiatives coming down the pipeline, it's a bit like taking a drink out of a fire hose. Um, it's quite daunting. And the resources that they have, the expertise that they have, in a lot of cases, just isn't up, up to scratch. They do not have the people and the time and the energy and the money, as, as Maya and others have said, um, to deal with all of these things effectively. Um, so what we, what we really are saying from a city's point of view is that we want to do this. We want to do it well. Um, and that means, A, cities are going to need a lot more support. Uh, in terms of money and people and training. Uh, and B, it means you need to do a district level or neighborhood level of approach. Because if you try and implement all these different things individually, uh, it's, never going to, it's never going to work. You're going to be digging up roads uh, every, other, every other month for one initiative or another. There has to be, within the spatial and zoning plans of cities, all of these things have to come together and break down all those silos within cities. Uh, it's not how they're built. It's not how cities have operated normally. Uh, so there's a big transformation in how they operate in order to implement all these things. Um, and it's important to say that cities, especially our members, really want to implement these things. There's a, there's a clear need from the citizens, a desire from the citizens, and from uh, the mayors who, who are really driving these things. But they're going to need help because this is, this is a massive, massive transformation. Uh, when you get to the renovation wave itself, um, it's really important to think of it not as one big wave where you're renovating all the buildings over a certain amount of time. Uh, as Maya said, you really want to start with some of your easiest cases. So in that case, you're looking at yeah, social housing, municipal buildings, schools, buildings that tend to have a fairly simple structure, social housing tends to have a, a very similar structure between buildings, which you know, allows you to simplify the, the, the renovation and standardize it. Um, and from our point of view as well, there's a really important 
um, tipping point that comes with renovating those buildings first because you can use it to implement things like community energy projects where your school, uh, you know, during the renovation or on its roof, which then becomes part of a, a community energy scheme that other people can, can contribute to and invest in and benefit from. Um, so you're reducing your heat load, but you're also increasing the generation of, of clean electricity. Um, so it's important to, to look at that. The other thing is, you know, uh, Paris have unveiled their, their 15 minute city kind of initiative. Um, when we're renovating these buildings, we need to have a plan on, do we have the right types of buildings in the right places? There's no point uh, if we have a, a, I know, a corporate village type thing where it's just suburban office parks. Do we need to change the fundamental uses of some of those buildings to get rid of a lot of the commutes, to increase the uh, green energy production, to decrease the heat? All of these things need to be incorporated into one plan. Um, so that just, again, that just reinforces the need for a tremendous amount of planning to incorporate all these diff different initiatives and the, um, the changes that are needed in order to do this well. You know, Maya was talking about how long th this process is and how long it's going to take. If we want to hit those 20, 30 targets that are being discussed right now, uh, we're only going to have one shot at it. Um, we need to plan really, really well and implement it well on the first try. Uh, there's a, a project ongoing at the moment called the EU City Facility, which we think is a great model. It's essentially a, a one-time grant for cities, 50, 60,000 euro, that helps them build up their internal capacities. Um, and it's important to, to make the distinction between different types of cities, right? I mean, a city like Amsterdam or Paris or Munich or Heidelberg that has a, a long history uh, and has built up a lot of internal expertise is going to have a lot less trouble than say the town where I live. I live in suburban Brussels. We've got 14,000 people. Uh, and yeah, you've got one uh, Echevin who's working on this in her spare time in the evenings at her kitchen table. She needs a tremendous amount of help to try and develop these sorts of plants. Um, we think that within the renovation wave, uh, as I said, you're not going to have to tackle all the buildings right from the get go. You're going to start off with those schools and social housing municipal buildings. Uh, you need different levers then again for things like commercial buildings where you can just maybe implement a series of really aggressive standards and say by 2025, you have to have a, a C level, a B level and a level uh, EBR. Um, because, you know, th th that's a, a business case. You can make the investment. Borrowing costs are relatively low. They have the resources in-house as a com commercial building owner to implement these things. Um, so that's, that's a set of levers you can use in that sector. But then when you looked at sectors like single family dwellings and especially condominiums where, you know, apartment buildings where 41% of Europeans live, those are incredibly difficult to scale and you're looking at really long time frames. I mean, even for, for a condominium, they normally have some sort of a board, whether it's run by a factor or a trustee or, what, or a, a conseil, um, and they'll meet once a year to discuss things. Uh, so you need to, and you're not, you're not gonna get sign off on a project in one 90 minute meeting. They're gonna wanna reflect, they're gonna have questions. So you're looking, generally speaking, at at least a two year time frame to get approval for a project, and that's after you've done all the research and the costings and, and finding suppliers um, and, and done the, the technical plannings and all of that. Um, so the, the, the time frames, yeah, they're just they're really, really long, uh, and we need to, to get started. So in that renovation wave, we need to start on, on the condominiums, but we're not going to see projects delivering cuts in, in emissions for a number of years to come. Uh, and that applies whether you're, you're looking at doing district heating or whether you're trying to use heat pumps, depending on whatever, um, whatever works best in that local area. Um, and of course, the, the beginning step is to use something like heat maps where you're, you're mapping the, the heat needs and the sources of heat within, within your city. Um, so that's, that's the, the, main, the main thrust of what I wanted to start with is the fact that a lot of the smaller cities that we all live in across Europe 
are going to need a tremendous amount of help. Um, and it will come from coordinating at the local level, the regional, the national level, and of course the EU framework on top. Um, there's a lot of steps that need to go in the right direction in order to, to make that help happen and to clear the path for um, a smooth renovation wave. And from the local level, we'll be looking at, at the, the neighborhood approach, but we need other things. And, and I, I can't uh, understate my support for, for Maya's claim that, uh, you know, having a, a blanket uh, statement that, you know, we're getting out of gas by X date fundamentally changes the conversation that you're having. Uh, and you're no longer looking at trying to make boilers more efficient. It's we're changing and what's the best option to change. Uh, and I think that's a really important message too. So uh, that's my little introduction and, uh, and I look forward to continuing the chat. Yes, thank you so much, Adrian. And also for um, bringing us the bigger picture again on the renovation wave. Um, emphasizing again the urgency, but also the ambition that will be important to get things right. As you said, we only have one shot at this to um, decarbonize by 2050. I don't even have to invite my speakers to put on the camera. I see that everybody is on camera again. Thank you so much. Now we will open the floor um, to a short panel discussion. And we already have one question that already touches on a really important topic that I would like to bring up as well, and it's the trade-off and also the complementarity of heat networks and building renovation. So Jeremy is asking, especially Brit, um, how you go about uh, when in your pilot zones, when you develop district heating, how you balance the heat network deploy deployment and the energy renovation measures in buildings, knowing that um, rushing the latter could financially hinder the former. And I also see that Maya wanted to come in here. I think that probably a lot of panelists have something to say on this. So Britt, please, do you have some first answers? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Jeremy. This is a, a balancing exercise, um, but in our research for, for, the, for the zones, for our heat zoning map, we looked into the to total cost of ownership. And even if the demand decreases with 50%, it's still the most positive heating concept. Um, another thing, the first focus uh, in, our, in our action plan is on the buildings with real high demand, like uh, large apartment block and also historical buildings where it's difficult to renovate. But the long-term goal is to connect all the houses in the zones and also help them with the energy renovation measures. Um, we want to work complementary and not hinder each other. Uh, we have a common goal, namely reducing CO2 emission. And I think it's necessary to work together in all areas of these, these um, concepts and balance the, the cost that you make of it. Thank I you, hope. Britt. Yes. Maya, do you, do you also want to add something to this question about the complementarity of heat networks and building renovations? Yeah, it, uh, in my view, it's the only way we can go forward if we come with business models wherein heat, district heating uh, uh, combines with uh, 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 all sorts of uh, uh, using of less heat. And uh, uh, saying that uh, 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 district heating is only vi viable if there is, is a lot of heat use is, I think, an old fashioned and unsustainable way of looking at the future. And in Holland, we already see that in the uh, deals that corporations make with uh, heat companies, they put in a, a, a percentage that they are allowed to go down in heat use. They want help with that. And uh, this is a deal they do together. And uh, uh, the heat company gets uh, uh, more uh, uh, heat over to either go down in temperature or to uh, uh, go to other districts. So um, it, it, it's, it, it's one way of looking at heat, uh, uh, which I think we have to throw out of the window uh, 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 and go and look at another way. Thanks a lot, Maya. All right. Um, if we maybe look now more in the Balkan region and Croatia, Tomislav, could you tell us a little bit more how you go about, um, because we know that uh, there might be a very old building stock in many of your cities and at the same time also the district heating infrastructure is sometimes still outdated and needs retrofitting. So how do you see this problem? 
Sure. So unfortunately, our district heating operators uh, don't look very um, positively uh, towards building renovation because it does directly cut into uh, their profit margins. And another thing that's, that's sometimes even worse, I mentioned the low price of heat. Uh, it also incentivizes the uh, homeowners to install uh, or to, to request uh, lower uh, uh, power connections. And that is where actually the district heating operators in Croatia make most of their uh, profits uh, from the power, not from the energy. Uh, when I say power, I mean, I don't mean electricity, but the, the power of the strength of the heat connection. Um, however, uh, since most of the heating supply uh, when it comes to district heating in Croatia is fairly high temperature, and I'm talking about supplies of between 90 and 110, uh, this hinders the implementation of renewable energy sources. It's, it's very difficult to integrate uh, solar or uh, waste heat or uh, heat pumps into district heating systems of such high temperatures. Building renovations can help here quite a lot because uh, usually when a building is refurbished, the, 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 the heating supply within it, so the radiators, for example, uh, become uh, uh, overdimensioned and they require a much lower temperature uh, than the one they had when the building was not refurbished. So this actually drives the option to decrease the supply temperature and with that also integrate uh, renewables into the systems. Our district heating operators uh, are realizing this and now they, they are slowly changing their mind about uh, building renovation and they're now actively looking for options to partially refurbish uh, sorry, to partially reduce the temperatures in, in, in parts of their grids uh, in order to drive uh, such an integration. And if we look at the, the, the entire approach holistically, as Maya has stressed a couple of times in her presentation, uh, there's a lot of synergy between building refurbishment and district heating when we look at it this way. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes. So Tomislav sees the win-win situation as well, actually, but it's a little bit more complicated um, in this region. Yes, Maya. Yeah, but in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the lowering of temperature has been a debate for uh, some time. And uh, what we're finding out is that 70, 70 degrees is actually a, a really good standard, as long as we still need to, uh, in Holland, we have Legionella uh, law. Uh, so the heating water always has to be 70 degrees for the shower, etc. If we can get rid of that by other innovative measures, that would be really cool because that would open the door to a lot more uh, uh, options uh, and make it a lot less costly. Uh, 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 so anything, anyone with a good idea for that uh, is welcome. But now we need to deal with that. And 70 degrees seems to be, a, uh, for housing, it's quite okay to go to 70 degrees. We are finding out without like huge you know, uh, 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 renovation. You can even do it with small measures that will cost you like a thousand euros for your house, which you will easily win back so also for a low income that is a lot more interesting and 70 degrees gives a lot more uh, space to all sorts of uh, 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 heating uh, 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 so it, 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 that for us is a really good way what we're going right now yeah yeah thank you so much Maya with this and also conscious of the time, I would like to move to another topic, namely a lot of you already talked about this, how we can make building owners and also citizens part of this transition. Maybe Adrian can sh share a little bit with us um, some projects you might have on cooperatives and so on um, that, that you think are interesting and the way forward for, for a lot of cities. Do we have some insights there, Adrian? Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's crucial, uh, to be honest, you have to, you, you start where it's easiest, right? So, uh, the people who want to make changes are the ones you need to engage with and, uh, get on board and empower to, to make those changes. Uh, we've seen, there's actually the, a Belgian city called Iclo, um, that's been really, really, um, positive and has driven some really great, uh, district heating projects. Uh, straight on, on the back of, they've, they've done it largely alone, um, just with a really charismatic mayor and, and a, a citizenry that is looking forward to, to the 21st century and trying to get their city up to, up to scratch. Um, 
I think the lesson that you can take that would, can be applied uh, quite broadly is that you need to look for those for those groups and get them involved. So we have a lot of them in terms of community ed energy projects because um, solar panels are sexier, frankly. Um, but reaching out to those groups as a as a at a, as a starting point, because they have that interest in decarbonizing, they have clearly an awareness about climate change, um, reaching out to those groups and trying to expand them to look at things like heat uh, is a really valuable first step in terms of trying to get going and, and get the, the decarbonization moving. Great, thank you so much, Adrian. And indeed, I think a close example is probably worth an own webinar for, for Celsius in the future. Um, Maya, you had a really funny picture in your presentation, namely somebody hugging their gas stove. Could you share a little bit with us uh, what you did to, to bring the citizens on board? Um, yeah, I have to say uh, in Holland, that how, did, how I got the cities on board? The citizens, so the people oh, the that have to agree to not have a gas stove at home anymore and probably change their cooking style. I don't know if we are already that far. Uh, I would say it's a huge debate at the moment in the, uh, in the Netherlands uh, uh, if uh, uh, citizens are willing to go off gas. And we have uh, uh, we don't have one citizen. We have 40% uh, uh, or 50% which thinks it's a great idea. And we have 50% that thinks it's a horrible idea. And we have everything in between. Um, so uh, uh, we're not there yet at all, um, but we, we do have, of course, a problem with gas in the Netherlands uh, with Groningen. So that is a bit of, a, 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 yeah, uh, uh, that makes the debate uh, more uh, uh, interesting than if it's just climate, which is like 2050. We ha actually have a problem now. And if we uh, uh, stop using Groningen's gas, we have to get it from like Russia and that will be a different kind of gas also. So we have to uh, uh, make changes to the houses and make changes to the fabrics and make all sorts of changes anyway, also to some grids. So in that regard, we are a different country and uh, uh, the debate goes differently. But I wouldn't say that we have uh, uh, the Dutch people in it at all. And, and I mean, even not the companies uh, and the gas stove companies. I started talking to the gas stove companies like Siemens, etc., two years ago. And I said, oh, you have this huge opportunity. You can start selling electric stoves in Holland because we're going to go off gas. And they were like, hmm. Yeah, we sell about so many uh, gas stoves. No, I don't think we like that movement. No, don't count us in. We don't want to be in there. So, I mean, and now they're, they're finally seeing opportunities, but it took them already, the, the, uh, 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 and we, we sell a lot of German uh, gas stoves. Uh, 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 so you also have, you're talking in the Netherlands, but you have to talk in, in Germany to change the way and the tune. So, uh, uh, I mean, this is a whole thing and that's why it takes so long. But the, the one thing I wanted to say is I'm, I'm now doing, um, now, uh, if we talk about citizens taking ownership of uh, uh, district heating, which we see in Denmark and, 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 and which is really cool and which people in the Netherlands want also, but we're talking about a completely different time frame. Uh, so in, in, in some of the countries, it took years to build that up. Now in Holland, we have to do that like in five, 10 years. And people are also investing in solar panels. They're investing in, uh, 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 in windmills. And now they also with their uh, 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 neighborhood have to invest like 15 million, uh, uh, 10 million into their district heating. It is quite a, a, a big stretch to do that in such a short period, in such a long time, also considering that these are, I mean, a windmill is not that risky anymore. We've done that for the last 10 years. We know uh, uh, the business model, we know how to do it. District heating in, in, a, in, in small town, and they don't, they all want it with like these really nice heat pumps and innovation and uh, uh, all these, it's really risky business. So if you're doing that in like a uh, uh, hundred uh, uh, cities in the Netherlands, in a, uh, uh, this is gonna, we need like a, a saving account 
on the uh, maybe in Brussels or uh, in the Netherlands where these citizens can go if if it goes wrong because otherwise you get such difficult stories going up that you will have uh, 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 times to <laughs> to repair the the image that goes from that so uh, uh, we're still in a piloting stage in everything and we don't have the money and we don't have the expertise that is what it comes down to yeah there's actually a question touching upon this as well um namely the the price uh, it comes from Nick, and I think it's open to the whole panel, so whoever feels like taking it, please go ahead. He's asking if you think that the heat consumer continues to look at price parity with gas as the main driver for uptake, um, because of course, uh, what, what are the effective ways of communicating that the individual gas boilers are probably costing the consumer more money through flue gas, losses, lack of maintenance, and so on. Yes. Yeah. I see Maya would be ready to give an answer. Yeah, I, th th this is such a good question because uh, uh, I started a campaign recently, uh, 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 put your boiler at 70 degrees because in the Netherlands they're all at 90 degrees, which is completely ridiculous. Even an HR, uh, uh, high, uh, 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 how do you call that, HR uh, kettle doesn't work on 90 degrees, it works on um, like 50, 60. So you're you're taking out all the benefits of this really good boiler that you have. And we're doing that massively in the Netherlands. I started a campaign on that, and uh, this is such a difficult message to, uh, to get okay, to get across. We also started a campaign that you can, for a thousand euros, you can uh, uh, make, uh, go 50% down on your gas bill, which is all we know that that is uh, quite or less true. Uh, um, but how do you get it across? This is in communication. This is so difficult. So yes, it would make a difference, but uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, you need really good communicators for that. And uh, uh, we're already overstressed with everything we're telling them about climate and energy. But I, I would think it would be a, a, a really good campaign in the EU to talk about uh, uh, th those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Maya. I also see Tomislav wants to add something. Yeah, some, something very, uh, very short. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, when you're coming from the perspective of uh, Northern Europe, or especially from countries that have an established tradition in district heating, that, that people don't, might not think about this much, but uh, here in the Balkans and in Southeast Europe in general, uh, one thing that this district heating usually has a very bad reputation. It's, it's seen as an archaic communist way of heating. Uh, you usually have this perspective that uh, you know you 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 get the heat when the company gives it to you. You you cannot control it if you're, you know, it's shut off uh, during the night to preserve energy. And there's a, there's a lot of negative connotations that are connected to it. Uh, most of this is actually not true, and this is also something that needs to be clearly defined. So, for example, in some very old buildings, and the old way of running the system was basically that the system operates between, for example, 5 a.m. and 11. Uh, PM and it is shut off during the night unless the temperature goes below a certain period, uh, sorry, below a certain point. And, you know, with gas, you don't have these issues. You heat how much you want, when you want, and so on and so forth. The modern systems are different. You basically have your own individual substation that basically acts like your own boiler and you can regulate your heat freely. You're incentivized to be efficient, but you don't have to be. So, there's a lot of information that doesn't really go to the consumers. Uh, gas is very often seen as a clean source of heat by uh, the end consumer because you don't really smell it, you don't see it, you don't immediately see the consequences as you do, for example, from coal or from uh, fuel oil or even from very small and inefficient uh, biomass burning stoves. So people don't have this perception and this is something that you know should really be targeted uh, as, as an information campaign the other thing and this is actually something that is now slowly happening in Zagreb is the safety issues so uh, anybody who's been following the news has probably seen the earthquake that hit the city of Zagreb a couple of months ago uh, a lot of the uh, gas installations uh, were damaged uh, a lot of the chimneys fell apart and people basically lost their ability to use 
uh, their boilers. And then they started thinking, you know, it could have been even worse, something would have exploded. Uh, because of this, now we cannot use the system. It's not so easily repaired. You cannot just take one out, put another one in. You have to rebuild your, your boiler. You have to check your installations and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of arguments against using individual gas, but people don't really think about them uh, until your house falls apart. So I think this is also something that needs to be pushed. Thank you so much, Tomislav. Yes, we are already going into the direction what um, what wishes you have for maybe the commission where to put money and so on. And uh, I already hear that there is a big need for a communication campaign. Um, I would like to hand over to Adrian and also to Brit to hear a little bit from you. Um, also coming back, of course, to our topic of the renovation wave, what are your member cities' needs, for example, and what should be included in the renovation wave to, to make a, a big difference there? Adrian, please. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in one second. Going back to the previous point that Tom, Slav, and Maya, and, and the question, because it is a good one. Um, the, the fact is, it's really difficult communications wise um, because we have a serious cost problem and tax problem. Uh, and fundamentally, we need to be working on addressing that issue more than the, the communications. Uh, we need a different cost and tax structure to incentivize low carbon heating. Uh, we've spent decades uh, promoting fossil fuel heating and making it cheap and affordable for good reasons, you know, we thought. Um, we need to address those, those issues and that legacy uh, legislation uh, going forward and that will make the communications a lot easier. Um, specifically in terms of what cities need from the renovation wave, it's undoubtedly uh, the technical and resources support to organize and plan and implement uh, all of these different initiatives that are coming down the pipe. Like I said, they're trying to drink out of a fire hose of all the things that are coming towards them, all the different initiatives. You know, I picked out, I think, seven different initiatives from the Green Deal. There's 47 or 49 different uh, points included in that communication from last December. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot. And cities, especially small cities, are gonna need a tremendous amount of help in order to plan and implement the changes that we need to implement and that they want to implement. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Britt, what, what would Antwerp need from the renovation wave or how would Antwerp use it? Um, it's a difficult question to, to answer here, um, I think but it's, it's general, make it more about the CO2 reduction. It's been said many times, uh, the holistic approach, not only focus on the building level, uh, would help us if there will be more tools to do this. Um, I think uh, Susanna also mentioned it, that there is a gap in Antwerp. There certainly is a gap between the energy planners and what they know technically um, of the heating and, and cooling um, system. So they, there is a gap and that's something for Antwerp to do as well, to, to teach them what is the heat zoning plan and what is the long-term plan in Antwerp. But it's, it's so much all together right now, so we don't have enough uh, capacity to do all this. And then you also have the communication of the district heating, which was said earlier, uh, the PR. Um, people in Antwerp don't know what district heating is about, or if they know, they, they think about what Tomislav said, uh, is the, what the problem with it is. Um, and it's, it's something that we have to do with. We could use help with this from, uh, from Europe and from the renovation wave. Great, thank you so much, Britt. And as we have to finish up, I would just like to hand over to Tomislav for a final remark as well, if you have one last wish from the renovation wave. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I think the answer is yes in Croatia. So yeah, we do need the, the we basically need technical assistance on the local level to help cities implement actions such as the one I've described uh, for the city of Karlovac. We do need f funds, basically grants to, to help us renovate. We, we could really use uh, technical assistance on the national level to help with uh, what Adrian's mentioned about uh, you know changing the way energy is taxed and changing changing the the energy market. So yeah, we we need it all. So everything will help. Okay, excellent. And Maya, what would be your big uh, yeah wishes for the renovation wave for the Netherlands? Yeah, I would really like a European pro pilot program uh, to, uh, for a gas exit. Uh, we have one in the Netherlands every year, 25 
neighborhoods get chosen and they get money and uh, uh, all sorts of guidance with each other and from lawyers and regulators etc to start the, the the gas exit because it's so completely fundamentally different from anything we've ever done uh, uh, that you're going in it and you just go from one hurdle to the other and i would really love if there was also a european program on that that made cities uh, 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 help each other because this is also about lower incomes this is about safety this is about and also about european regulation one of the problems i'm going into at the moment is the uh, 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 how you do you do a tender in uh, in a, a neighborhood where people want to choose their own energy company and if you have to apply the old-fashioned tender rules uh, you cannot do it because they don't know what they're what they're going to ask they they want a partnership they want somebody that's going to guide them that is going to put money into it because they know they will get the investment later and that is going to help them step by step to build up their technical uh, 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 their uh, all their knowledge which is complete so we're trying now with an open transparent uh, uh, competitive procedure in a, a city to see if we can do it which would sort of be not in line with regulation but we have no other way to do it because we cannot do a tender and that is a, a completely different way of thinking that we need also to come out of brussels that we need to come out of the, a new regulation that fits a more locally driven uh, uh, energy transition in such Great. a small time also yes thank you so much maya i have some good news for the cities, but maybe even consultants and everyone working on the heat transition locally. Um, what you just wished for basically exists already, that's the Celsius initiative. So we are trying to support cities and connect them. Um, if you want to be part of it, you know, follow the webinars, go to our website, we are happy to include you there. And this is basically the end of, of uh, the second panel discussion. Thank you so much uh, to all of the panelists. I now see that Paul has already joined us. He's the Managing Director of Euroheat and Power, and he will give some concluding remarks to this webinar. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Sophia. Good morning, everybody. I, I certainly didn't just join now. I've, I've been able to sit for, for two hours and listen, uh, and it's a rare treat to sit through a conference and, and not have to talk and just enjoy listening to a lot of people uh, talk about a subject that they understand so well, um, and because so much of what, what needs to be said this morning uh, has been said, I think I can do this briefly and let you guys get to your, your lunch. Um, but yeah, maybe a couple of things to wrap up. I, in, in this job, there are two traditional challenges in the policy debate that, that we have faced um, in the time that I've been doing it. The, the first is um, you often hear that we should simply stop needing so much heat. So you'll hear people say that the cheapest energy is the energy that we don't use. Uh, and there's some truth in that, but there's probably more truth in the idea that when you start to look closely at the problem, you immediately understand that actually you, you need both. Um, so we cannot achieve the decarbonization of our building stock without um, both cutting the need for energy and decarbonizing the heat that we do supply. And the other thing we learn, and it's been said, is that actually these two things are mutually reinforcing in the sense that if you have a better building that doesn't have an unnecessarily high level of demand, then you're able to make better use of local resources like waste heat or low temperature uh, renewables, which can be boosted with a heat pump or, or whatever. So there is and must be no tension between these two things. We shouldn't be trying to maintain an artificially high level of heat demand any more than we should be trying to make heat demand disappear because either way, it's, it's the wrong approach. And what works best is to bring the two together. And the second thing I've heard in recent years is it's not a problem, we'll just electrify everything. And here too, when you start to dig into the problem a bit, you see that there's an easier kind of win-win solution. Now there's going to be a big role, I think, in decarbonizing heat for heat pumps and by extension for electricity. But again, when you look closely at the problem, particularly in the city where you have a certain level of demand density, um, you find that a heat network can be an easier solution. And if you have local resources, be they waste heat or geothermal or solar thermal or whatever, um, you can actually reduce the need to reinforce the local power grid, which you would need to do massively if you wanted to really electrify everything. 
by meeting a, a part of that demand with a heat network that can use these local resources. And I think this renovation wave is an opportunity for the Commission to, to clarify some of these points. Um, and and, and, and I, I know that not all of these problems can or should be solved from Brussels, but storytelling matters, narrative matters. And I think a lot of member states and local authorities for that matter still look to Brussels for leadership in this area. So even though this is a non-legislative initiative, it's hugely important for the Commission to make progress in helping everyone understand what the renovation wave might look like uh, and, and, and some of the things that it needs to include, in, including the decarbonization of heat. Um, I think the renovation wave in that sense is an opportunity to allow for or encourage a more thoughtful and more importantly, more effective uh, renovation wave in, in cities across Europe. You know, we, we, we have to do this right. We can't afford to do it inefficiently or in a way that's unnecessarily expensive. And of course, a lot of these decisions, as has been said, will need to be taken at a, at a local level. But there's a framework that needs to be set out. And I think that the renovation wave is, is obviously the right place to do that. And I'm encouraged by what I've heard this morning because so many people who don't work for us have said things that I believe to be true. And um, I'm really hopeful that we'll see a lot of these things reflected uh, in the paper that comes out from, from the Commission in a few weeks. I think there's a bit of a contradiction sometimes in our discourse. On one hand, um, I've talked a lot and we've talked a lot in recent years about how heat is so important that the EU has to deal with it. We say that all the time and I still believe it to be true. At the same time, um, we also say heat is very local in nature uh, and there needs to be an extremely important role for local authorities there. Now, both of these things can be true at the same time. Um, what's needed is simply to make them work together. And that's why it was so nice uh, to have so many people with experience working with this problem on the ground at local level to share their practical experiences because only by listening carefully to the needs of our local communities can we get a framework in Brussels that actually makes sense for them? It's something that they can use and something that doesn't exist in a, in a vacuum that people at local level don't recognize. Um, so I found all this very encouraging. Making this whole thing work is a huge challenge for, for the EU, for cities, for our industry. I mean, we can ask for lots of things from regulators, but we also have a job to do, in continuing to change and, and evolve in a way that makes heat networks part of the solution rather than a relic of the past um, of the type that, uh, that Thomas Luff described. Um, I'm encouraged um, by the richness of the discussion around heat in Brussels and in cities around Europe at the moment. And I can promise you all that our sector is more committed than ever to playing our part and trying to make it happen. Um, simply remains, I think, for me to thank all the speakers uh, and my colleagues for the, for the moderation and everyone who was able to attend. And uh, I wish you all uh, a very good day, and I'm looking forward to lots more exchange on this as we go forward. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.